whenever I'm out and playing on the court, I would uh, look up at the stands, like see, look at my parents or whatever, and I'd always see Andy up there and his wife just sitting up there. Noah's on my team too, he came to see us both. But just to see him caring about being there to support people, and I look over the stands, he's over like, yeah, go Zach, go Noah. And it just, it's very, very humble. We were playing a game called Smash Face, and he didn't know what it was, and he kept calling it like face smash, smash ball, like it was just really funny. And then the second he got in the middle, like you smash it into their face and he got nailed in the face and it was really funny. I would describe Andy, I'd probably say humble because he's kind of really about other people and he always thinks about others and he just goes out of his way to like do something nice for for you if you know if you're down or if you're happy like he'll just do that anyway um i remember like he would always like send me these like devotional text messages and he'd always you know go out of his way and to do things for other people and he i remember him telling me happy birthday and like that was one thing that i really remember that we did. he just cared about all of the teams and he was uh he was always there for everybody at the retreat he all of a sudden just started calling me joss or what was it it was really like funny though, and um, he would always ask the weirdest questions or uh, stupidest games on the way there. Um, <laughs> it was just funny, and he just made lots of jokes and made everyone laugh. Right water rafting, and we reached kind of like a flat area, and um, our guide told people that they could ride the bowl and he just climbed over everyone and sat on it and we hit a bump and he kept on falling over onto Olivia and Jemima. <laughs> he was super open with everything. He liked to uh, talk with people and understand their problems and help them get, get through with it. He would always make us play these stupid games that actually ended up turning out to be fun. We went white water rafting and he was sitting next to me in the boat, and he kept cheering me on to get on the front, and I didn't want to, because like, I'm not really good at that kind of stuff. And like he kept encouraging me throughout the whole entire ride. We found out his favorite soda is Mellow Yellow, and we wanted to surprise him when he got back from high school camp with a, like a 12-pack of Mellow Yellow. And then on the actual middle school camp trip, we um, got it out and campaign glasses out. But it, me and Jemima started arguing over if the old Mel Yellow logo is better than the new logo. And then Andy's just laughing in the background, just listening to us. We were making a video to advertise um, a youth event, and it was Andrew and um, <laughs> and Elizabeth and I, and we, um, we were kind of planning it, and it was a fun idea, and then when we were practicing it, it was being really silly, and it was a lot of fun. My favorite Andy memory of Andy Inskeep, well, there are so many that I can choose. But Andy Inskeep is one of my great heroes. He will be on, in my heart for the rest of my life. He was a coach, he was a friend, and he was a mentor too. One of my most amazing memories of Andy Inskeep is that when I was teaching a first and second grade class, I was on a mission, I was on a roll, I had a plan, and I was asking the class a question. What is some amazing thing that you've seen or amazing person you've seen? Well, I asked him for his answer, and he said that there was this amazing girl who shot a ton of three-pointers in a basketball game. And I'm like, who is that? And he goes, that's you, Swifty. He made an effort to put me as a great example to these kids. He knew about me, and he wanted to give an effort to show me that I was important. Now granted, it completely threw me off track, destroyed my lesson plan, but he wanted to make sure that I was important and that I felt loved. That was one thing that Pastor Andy was amazing at, and I will always remember him for that, and I will always try to emulate that. One word to describe Andy is caring. He was supportive. He was always at anyone's events. Awesome. Humble, because he's kind of really about other people. And he searches. He searches for every single person out there. He was a coach, he was a friend, and he was a mentor, too. Hey, so I'm Amber. This is my husband, Jason. Um, so Andy, for me, was spectacular. Um, he was one of the best leaders um, to follow. He was easy to follow. Um, 
he fit into this leadership team um, almost immediately. I like to call him the dream team. Um, he just fit. Um, and he laid a plan out in front of us that was really simple um, to complete. Um, but one of the things that Andy, you, you guys heard the kids, um, Andy was consistent. And um, he asked, I like to call it Andy's um, thousand random questions. Um, but he would, um, a student would walk in or almost anybody would walk in and he'd, he'd exclaim, Esther, what's the most annoying thing your brother did today? Or Gideon, what's the craziest thing you ate today? And although he would log that answer in his brain for some other later use, um, it was the fact that he did not ask yes or no questions. He asked questions that got a conversation started, asked questions that really got him to know people. He, once he got comfortable, um, he was a big personality, but he was one of the most unassuming persons that would sit in a room, which made him incredibly approachable and um, easy just to come around, um, which I think was one of his greatest gifts with teens um, because of the approachability. Um, he uh, went above and beyond. Most of us, um, I'm going to have Jason read a card that Andy had written to Noah in June. Um, Randy, and, Randy and Andy had sent Noah a card for his birthday. But Andy didn't just call it in and just write and sign his name like most of us do. Um, so I'll have Jason read that. So, so bear with me because I was worried about her today. <laughs> and I thought I had it handled, but anyway. So this is a great example of the randomness of Andy and how he made it personal. Happy National Smile Power Day. I know it makes June 15th a special day, Pastor Andy. P.S. Happy birthday. Your birthday definitely makes June 15th more important than something about smiling. <laughs> so he didn't just call it in. He reached out and he made memories with people. Um, those of us that were there in Hood River that day like to say that we're part of a club that we never wanted to be a part of. But I actually like to think that everyone that Andy impacted is part of a club. And what we've learned is it's not just the church that he served at. It is across the country and across the world. Andy's impact was so big. And I know that I'm forever changed. And I know that we will all be forever changed because he changed who I am and how I react and how I respond to people. And he did not sweat the small stuff. He laid a path and let God work out the details because God is so big. And, um, and Andy knew, he nailed it time and time again that our relationship with Christ is lived out with, through our relationship with others. And that's our goal. And I'm just so grateful that he was my friend and that I got to live life a little bit with him. <clears throat> so we call today John 15, 13 Sunday. Um, because it just fits how Andy lived. Um, and let's be honest, we're going we're to talk about this today. It fits how he lived and how he died. And so how about we do this? John 15, 13, it's the, the, the verse on the back of our shirts. And um, I want us all to read it together. Let's go ahead and put that up on the, on the screens here. And all right, here we go. Read this with me. Read it out loud. Read it like you believe it and like you've been inspired by it. Okay, here we go. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Hey, do we have, uh, do we have any more of the, the, the bracelets today? We had some of the students running around. Okay, we got a bunch of those. Um, all right, anybody else, did anybody not get a keep the faith bracelet who would like one today? 
Anybody? Raise your hand. We all got, we all got them. You guys, they've got a few of them. All right, a couple of our students, grab them here. Anybody who's raised their hand, toss it to them. We're touching them, so they're probably not COVID friendly. You should probably quarantine your bracelet for 48 hours before you wear it. But, uh, oh, especially right down here in the front. Here we go. Let's, anybody else want to break? Oh, a couple of, oh, way up in the, uh, up in the balcony. Don't forget the balcony, folks. We just, we said we want to give them all away. Any more available there? All right, Jemima's headed up to the balcony with the remaining few of them. All right. Have a few left. Going to the back. Oh. All right, do we give them all away? Oh, the last ones. All right, we gave them all away. Hey, so today we are, uh, t- today, today we're remembering. You, you can go ahead and put that, uh, put that verse back up there if you want. This is, the, uh, this is our theme for today. We're talking about this. And you know, this verse comes from the mouth of Jesus. He spoke it to his disciples as he was on a walk with them. And it was a very crucial time in his life. It comes in John chapter 15. And he had just got done eating the Passover meal, what we call the Last Supper with his disciples. When they get done, he, I mean, he washes their feet. He has a conversation. And then he says, guys, let's take a walk. And they take a long walk to the, to, uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, shortly after this conversation, he will pray through the night. He will be arrested, tried, crucified, died, die, and will be buried. And so in this conversation, he knows what is about to happen. He has tried to hint to his disciples what will happen. They haven't been listening too well. And so this is his last chance to kind of reinforce everything that he said to them and to prepare them for what is happening. And so, so related in that, a little bit, little bit after this kind of teaching time, John chapter 16, it's in the same kind of a conversation. Look what he says to them here. He's preparing them for what's going to happen. And he says in verse 22, So with you, now is the time of your grief... But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. As I thought about what does it mean for us to, to be inspired by Andy with John fifteen thirteen, I thought about the time, that, what, what, what makes this time, this odd mixture of sorrow and of joy, this is it right here. He says, now is your time of grief, but you will see me again. He says, you will mourn, but it won't be easy. The, the, these guys, they, they are not prepared for him to be arrested, tried, and crucified, and dead, and put in a tomb. That was never in their imagination, even though he tried to tell it to them time and time again. And so on that late Friday night and that Saturday morning and early, early Sunday morning until they heard the good news, it was a time of mourning, and it was not easy. And right now, we're kind of living in that time we're, we're going to talk a little bit about it. We're living in this time where it's, it's this odd combination of both grief and joy, especially as followers of Jesus. So let's talk about the grief part a little bit. We grieve because we miss Andy, because, because he just so, uh, so, so affected our lives and so influenced our lives, and we just love spending time with him. And, and well, you know, one of the ways that we grieve, and I imagine Jesus' disciples did this as well on that Saturday, although they were sad that they were telling stories. Do you remember the time he did this? Do you remember the time he took the one meal of, you know, fish and bread and we fed everybody? Oh, yeah, it was amazing. That was amazing. And so we tell stories. And guys, I so appreciate you sharing some stories. And let's continue to tell stories. And it is okay to continue to tell the fun stories. Sometimes it's hard to tell the stories. So this week I was cleaning up some old voicemails on my phone and looking through the visual voicemail and realized I still had two old voicemails from Andy. And you know, just without even listening to them, I just couldn't delete them, right? And I don't know how long they're going to sit on my phone, but they're going to sit there for a while. And so last night I thought, well, I should actually listen to them. I'm not really sure what they were about. And interestingly enough, it just so fit Andy's personality. So one of them was earlier this summer, and our family had a quick getaway to Idaho and um, went to the amusement park, and we're riding to ride some roller coasters. And we are kind of in the early stages of bringing services back in person. 
And um, we had some decisions that, that weekend coming up. And so he leaves me a voicemail. And he says, hey, Jason, this is Andy. And uh, I just couldn't quite remember what the times were, what the plan exactly was for this weekend. So um, just wondering about that. Let me know if you can. But I know you're on vacation, so if you don't get back to me, that's all right. And uh, by the way, have fun riding roller coasters. I hope your neck doesn't hurt too bad afterwards because now we're getting old and riding roller coasters is hard and we, a little bit painful. I'm like, yeah, thanks for that, Andy. <laughs> And I was like, even in that voicemail, um, he, he leaves, he, he had this, so Andy had this great way of being one of the most, from my perceptions, relaxed, calm people that I knew. And, uh, and even in the voicemail, like, well, you know, if you get back to it, if you get around to call me back, that's okay. If not, you know, we'll figure it out. I'm pretty sure he really wanted me to call him, call him back so he could write down the plan and write it in his journal and so that, you know, he knew exactly what was going to happen this weekend. But he's like, oh, you know, if you, you get around to it. In fact, I remember even in the, in the interview process and we're, we're trying to discern, like we're looking for a brand new youth pastor. Is Andy going to be the guy? And, um, and so we had interviews and the interviews went really well and Maria was there and joining the interviews. And, and afterwards we said, okay, well, strengths, you know, what did you hear? What are his strengths? What are his weaknesses? And um, I remember some of the conversations like, well, he... Um, he likes to stay up late, he said, and he seems to watch a lot of movies. He said that a few times, that he watches movies a lot. And um, hmm, we we're like, is he going to be a very hard worker? <laughs> you know? um, he just seems so relaxed and, and just, uh, you know, answers. Sometimes he answers really nonchalantly, just like, well, you know, if it happens, it happens. We're like, I don't know about this guy. And, and then we called all of his references and they said, oh man, he's so great. He works so hard. He reaches out to every student. He will do whatever it takes. And we're like, okay. He comes across really nonchalantly. We hope he's not lazy, but everybody tells us he's going to work really hard and pursue all of our students. And we just realized later on that's just who he was. Super calm, relaxed, but yet focused. Loved his energy drinks. My goodness. I would just invite him out to coffee, and he's like, oh, coffee, I don't drink the stuff. As if coffee was bad for you or something. And then he's like pounding energy drinks every day. And Randy and I were making fun of him for his energy drinks. But he was Mr. Relaxed. He loved his slip-on canvas shoes. Oh, my goodness. Jason, I saw. You, had, you have some today in honor of Andy. I bet you don't have like 12 pair. Like he had like 12. You have two pair. I'm pretty sure you had 12 pair. Did you count them up, Maria? At least that. Yeah, one for every day of the week. And Randy and I, we'd, we'd, we'd make fun of him for wearing his slip-on canvas shoes unless he was just walking around the church in his socks because that was just so Andy. And yeah, we'd sit, we'd talk. Friday mornings, it's usually pretty quiet around here. And I and Andy were in the office, sometimes Lauren, and we'd have our 9 a.m. stand-up start of the day meeting. And sometimes on Fridays, we'd just sit in his office, and that 10-minute stand-up meeting would turn into a conversation of life and theology. And it could go deep, it could go personal. He just never kind of knew where it went. It was so much fun having him around on our team because we could be relaxed, and he was a friend and a colleague and a coworker. Erica and I, some of the other staff members, even over the last several weeks, have continued to say, is this really real? Like, is he really, is he really gone? And we walked by his office, and we've kind of left it that way for a little while. And I didn't know this, but Randy told me the same thing. Sometimes he'll grab a book and go sit in the easy chair, just like I will, in his office, and read for a little while. We're, we're, we're stuck in these difficult times of mourning, Sharing stories, it's not always easy, but we know it's good to share these stories. And I always encourage people at times like this, if the stories bring some tears, just to let them come. Even if the stories maybe bring a little bit of anger, just let that come as well. And just let the grief happen. And I, got, I got a challenge for you today. We've had a few people, uh, and we're going to have a couple more come share some stories. Here's what I encourage you to do today. Take your favorite social media channel, whatever it may be, and I want you to share your Andy story. Maybe just keep it with the, you know, hashtag it, keep the faith. Be sure to tag Keep in Skeep if you're on Facebook so that it can be posted to, to, his, uh, to his Facebook profile as well and so we can remember his influences. 
And whether you're a student who had a lot of influence with him, or a lot of time with Andy, or maybe you're a church member who, you're, it's been a while since you've been in the youth group, but you had a conversation with Andy because he didn't just focus on middle school, high school students, he loved us all. I want to encourage you today to post your favorite story, your favorite memory of even just that one conversation that you still remember when Andy touched your life and encouraged your life. And let's celebrate a life well lived today. Share your story of Andy. The encouragement Jesus gives us here, though, is that grief and mourning do not get the last word. Look what he says here. So it is with you. Now is the time of your grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. As followers of Jesus, we are resurrection people. The resurrection was not just something that happened to Jesus a couple of thousand years ago, but Jesus was the first of many resurrections. And the promise for us Jesus followers is that we have resurrection waiting for us as well. And Jesus says to them, now's the time of your grief, and that grief will last longer than you really want it to, but I will see you again. There will be resurrection. Jesus says he's, he's trying to prepare his disciples, right? He's like, I'm going to be arrested and crucified and died, and you're not going to be ready for that. And you're, you have grief. And then the Easter morning, that grief will turn to joy and I will be resurrected. He's also, though, preparing them for a more longer-term kind of a grief when 40 days after that, or when, 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 when yeah, when 40 days after that, he will, be asc- he will ascend into heaven and they will no longer see him and they will not see him face to face for the rest of their lives. But before he's ascended into heaven, he looks at them and he tells them he's going to return to angels come and they say just as you saw him go he will return you will see him again because we are resurrection people and your grief will turn to joy and no one will take that away from you he's ascended into heaven to return again but even in this conversation here as he's walking to the to, to the garden with his disciples he encourages them and he says look i'm going to send my holy spirit one of the words he refers to one of the ways he describes the holy spirit is as the comforter The Holy Spirit is the comforter, and the comforter will come, and the comforter, the Holy Spirit, will be with you, and one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is that he will bring comfort. And so important for us because it is so common for us to ask, why did this happen? And in 2020, when it just seems like we're getting hit with one piece of bad news after another, and I I don't know if there are more tragedies, even in addition to all, all the COVID stuff. I don't know if there are more tragedies or if just we're so kind of on edge already that we're noticing them, but when there's one piece of bad news after another and there's just kind of this accumulation of trauma and this accumulation of grief and it's heavy, we just find ourselves, you know, asking, why? Why does this keep happening? Why did this have to happen? And since I'm the pastor, people come to me and say, Jason, you're the pastor. You've read the Bible a lot. You're supposed to know more about God than the average person. So why does God let these things happen? And so I've thought through it over the years. And I think I've shared this at least one time before, but, you know, if if I could offer a rational explanation, well, I've just discovered I really can't, but but here's, here's where I've landed on things Kind of sometimes we'll draw it out in a little bit of a little bit of a graph, but but we'll, let's try this real quickly here. Um, let's just say that this line represents your life, and this is the timeline of your life. And to the pa- and to the left is the past, and to the right is the future. And then tragedy strikes, and on the timeline of your life, X marks the spot as the day that it happened. Whether it's the drowning that we're talking about today whether it's the other trauma, whatever it is in in, in your own life. And on this day, on the timeline of your life, everything changed, and your life could be split into the before and to the after, the past and to the future. And when we ask the question, why did this happen, here's what we're asking. We're asking, before that day, before that event, why did it happen? Why did God allow it to happen? And here's, here's where our assumption is. As God reveals himself, the God of miracles, even the God of resurrection, the God who can work out great plans according to his plan, where was God? 
in the days, in the weeks, in the moments, in the seconds leading up to the tragedy, why didn't God rearrange some things? Why didn't God send some different people? Why didn't God work it out in his power and ability that we know he could do? Why did he not work it out to change the course of events so this didn't happen? He could have done it. Why didn't God do it? Here's what I've discovered. The longer you keep asking and I keep asking, why, why, why? We, we basically get stuck in the past. And our lives and our thoughts and in our growth kind of get stuck into continuing to be stuck in before. When we're focused on why and when that's our only question and we can't move out of that, we are left with anger and bitterness. And I believe one of the reasons Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, is because he wants to help move us out of the past and to get unstuck from the past. And one of the ways that we get unstuck from the past is to ask a different question. See, I believe that God could explain it. I believe God could explain himself, although, I mean, in my Bible reading with uh, my daughter and I, we're reading through the Bible this year. We just got done reading the book of Job, and so I've read it different this week. And yesterday, we just read the last couple of chapters when God finally responds. And I've said it before, but I was really especially looking for it this time. Do you know that God never explains himself? And we kind of wish he would. And I believe God, he's so smart, he could explain things in a way that we could actually understand the answer to why. But, but the conclusion I've come to is that even if God would explain it to us in a way we could fully understand we would still say, but why? Or we would say, I don't like that answer. I'm not satisfied with that answer. And I believe one of the ways that we, that we move into the future so that we don't just remain stuck in the past, filled with anger and bitterness, is we ask a better question, and I believe the better question is this, what now? I don't know why, God could probably explain it, but he won't. And even if he did, I still wouldn't like it. So I'm going to let go of my demand to know why. Because I want to move into the future. Because I believe God has a good future for me. And I believe God has a good future for you. And he has good plans for you. And you need to move into that future. And the way we move into that future is letting go of asking why. And we begin to ask, what now? And when we begin to ask what now more than why, healing begins to come and recovery begins to come and the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, begins to move powerfully in our lives and the Holy Spirit, who is our comfort, the Holy Spirit, who is our guide, leads us into God's good future that he has for us and he immediately begins to answer the question, what now? And the Holy Spirit says, let me take the lead in your life and I will guide you and lead you into a good, good future. And so if you're struggling with grief today, if you're stuck asking why, I'm going to invite you today to begin letting go of the why and to begin asking what now. Say, oh, Holy Spirit, lead me into the future you have for me. Amber's going to come sing a song for us. A song that really kind of began to connect with several of our students and our leaders even kind of before this happened and this happened and it was like, boy, this is the song. And I want you to listen really closely to the words here because I believe this helps us to move into the future God has for us and God will begin to answer what now.
scared of everything I hold you hold my tomorrow and all tomorrow holds you already know I can seem to find the easy answers my weary heart So we're in this what now kind of a time. Jesus knew that his disciples also would be in a what now kind of a time. So he tells them what now. So John 15 in verse 5. He says, I am the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay, Jesus, that sounds good. So how do I remain in you? Well, then he answers that in verse 9. He says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, remain in my love. And if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and I remain in his love. Okay, so I want to remain in the love of Jesus by keeping his commands. Okay, so Jesus, what are your commands? Like the Ten Commandments? Jesus continues on. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Now our initial response to that would be like, okay, that's easy enough. Just one command. Love each other as I have loved you. Okay, I can do that because I'm a pretty loving person. I love people. I love my friends. I love my family. I mean, you know, I struggle sometimes, but you know. But I, I, I love people. I love my coworkers most of the time, most of them, some of the time. Jesus says, don't just love people. Like, it's not just an emotional feeling. And, well, look, look what he says here. Love each other as I have loved you. 
all of a sudden they realize, oh yeah, that's, boy, that's tough. Like if the standard of love, which is Jesus' commandment, is to love others as he has loved us, like he loves us even when we are difficult to love, even when we're disobedient. Jesus is the one who said, love your enemies, and he actually did it. And then just to make sure that they wouldn't allow the command of love to just be reduced to emotional feel-good moments, he says, let me make sure that we define what love is. And he gets to verse 13. If you can see it, read it with me, would you? Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And there it is. That's the standard of love. That is what love shoots for. That is the greatest definition of love. And so on that retreat in August, when the middle schoolers found themselves at the edge of a sandbar, and the sandbar collapsed, and several of them went into the very rough waters of the river, Andy and Sean jumped in to save them. When a windsurfer came by to help, Andy pointed the windsurfer away from himself to another student who was really struggling to rescue that student, and in pointing the rescuer away from himself, a student was rescued and Andy was lost. He sent the rescuer to save someone else and literally gave his life, literally laid down his life to save a friend the greatest love of all. Greater love has no one than this. One more tribute I'd like you to hear. Sean and Trish, I invite you to come on up and uh, share what God's laid on your heart, your tribute to Andy today. One way that uh, my friend Andy Inskeep impacted me was his accurate reflection of God's love. Um, We were uh, playing kickball, and the bases are inflated pools, and, uh, and Andy would... Uh, give a full sprint <laughs> and he's uh, he's uh, he wasn't in the kind of shape that it was wise to give a full sprint and a slide into a swimming pool but every time he was up to, to go to base it was a full sprint and a slide and I said he's, he's going to have trouble getting out of bed tomorrow <laughs> um, and that's how he lived his life uh, as if, as if he knew that time was short. Uh, another verse that Andy really lived out was that we loved you so much that we shared not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well. Uh, so my friend Andy, your friend Andy, God's friend, Andy Inskeep, uh, was a great reflection of God's love. Um, Yeah, one of the things that I noticed is it seemed like Andy was living life absolutely to the fullest. I I don't know if he knew that time was short or not. I don't know. I had the privilege of accompanying him on the high school retreat with Brandon's older brother, Alex. And Breton, Mason, Zach, Grace, and Avalon. And I didn't take hardly any pictures, and I wish that I had. His message on both retreats was for the students to make their faith their own. And in his passing, even in his passing, 
it's clear these students have made their faith their own in a very real way. But one of the funny things I remember, I mean, nothing could stop him from wanting to preach. Well, nothing could stop him from wanting to serve these kids and be with them. And one of my favorite things was we were outside kind of at our gathering time, and there was a kind of a, a crick behind the house where we were staying. It was sort of rushing crick. It was very cold. And we were trying to do the little social distancing thing, and so he had a chair, but he set the chair down, and, and what happened, Sean? Sean joined us for an evening. And uh, <laughs> the, the chair dug into the soft grass, and he went tumbling down the steep embankment, narrowly missing uh, some sharp rocks and not winding up in the rushing stream. Uh, and he climbed his way back up the, uh, the steep embankment, and, uh, and he, was, he was ready for our small group time. <laughs> and he looked like he had just gotten done playing a, a full game of rugby. <laughs> yeah, so that was the day we went whitewater rafting, and I, I, it was great, but I had kind of a headache, and I came outside, and I'm like, what happened out here? <laughs> but, and he kept going. And um, another thing I remember from that particular retreat was um, there was a, a, he went on an adventure with Zach, Breton, and Mason along the river, and uh, or along the creek, and I kind of walked along. It, there's a, and it, you have to kind of go down, and that water was cold. And they slid down the embankment, and they were playing in the water. And he had this boyish look in his eyes, like. And so I tagged along for a little while, but after a while, I said, "These boys need to just go play." And then I came back, and they're like, "When are we going to have dinner?" I'm like, "I don't know. He could be back in a half hour, or three hours. I have no idea." And then I was. And that evening, Breton was supposed to make the hamburgers because <clears throat> I, <laughs> uh, he promised me he would, but he, and he did. But you were back. You were back to make the hamburgers. And I remember, because uh, <laughs> if anybody knows me too, the cooking, when we got there, he's like, we didn't talk about this, did we? And I said, I'll, I'll do it. Amber prepared the whole thing. All I got to do was follow the the. the the, macro, the, the instructions. But anyway, I do remember that, that um, I didn't know when you guys would be back, and then I was in the window, and I saw you guys coming, running up the driveway, and, the, and uh, he just had this boyish, adventurous look in his eye, and I really I remember that, and I wish I could just capture that, but that's how he, he loved those moments, and they were uns, kind of unscripted, unplanned moments. And, um, two very short things. One thing I know, the very last words I heard Andy say, and we went around the table and talked about gratitude. The last words I heard him say that morning, each student went and each adult went, and he said, I am grateful for Randy Mead. And another thing that I was evident, he loved Maria. He loved his wife. I'd ask a couple questions while she started a new job. He would just light up. And he loved you so much. And I'm thankful for all of you. And um, I hope that we can continue to honor his legacy. I'm so proud of you guys. Thanks. Oh, thanks, guys. Uh, I'm pretty sure Andy would correct you, Trish, and say he was not playing in the crick. He was playing in the creek. <laughs> right, Grant? Andy would correct you on that one. All right, well, asking the question, what now, is a question for all of us. And so maybe you're asking, how does this apply to me? What does this have to do with my own life? Here, here's what I want you to consider today. When we talk about laying down our life for our friends, you know, the reality is that most of us will not have the opportunity to literally give our lives for someone, to die for someone. That doesn't let us off the hook, though. As I've been thinking and, and, and just kind of reflecting, especially over the last couple of months, 
it's this issue of, you know, we, we can ask, what are you willing to lay down your life for? What are you going to give your life for? Here, here's the reality. Well, maybe you and I are not going to have even an opportunity to give our lives for someone else, to die for someone else. You and I, we are maybe not giving our lives, but we are all spending our lives on something. And if we're lucky enough to get to old age and have an opportunity to reflect on our lives, you will reflect and ask the question, how did I spend my life and did I spend it in all the right places? You see, the reality is Andy not only gave his life to rescue some students, he also spent his life in ministry to students. And as, uh, as Jason shared earlier, uh, or it was Randy, well, we, we all kind of made mention to it, the student at Andy's funeral who said, I felt like I was his favorite, but I'm pretty much sure that we all felt like we were all his favorite, is just a little bit of an indication that he, he didn't just spend his life, he, he invested his life in students especially, but he invested his life in us. And he invested his life in people. And so keep the faith is not just about believing in Jesus, but keep the faith is really a reminder to continue to lay down your lives. For us to continue to lay down our lives and to really regularly consider, am I spending my life or am I investing my life? And what am I investing my life in? And I want to encourage you today that we ought to take note from the example of Andy who invested his life in the people God called him to serve. And when you and I invest our lives in people, great dividends are paid, and it's a great way to spend and invest our lives. We're going to continue to invest in the lives of students. In fact, um, Maria's desire early on was to establish a scholarship fund in honor of Andy. And so to date, with a combination of your offerings and gifts around the world and a, and a, and a pretty good donation from the church, the, uh, the balance continues, sits at right about $35,000 or so that will be used for as long as possible. <clears throat> It'll be used as long as possible to send kids from Ridgefield and from all the churches where Andy served to continue to follow God's plan for their lives. Jesus, of course, here, he really wanted his disciples to understand that he was talking about laying down his life and that when they saw him hanging on a cross, that they would recognize, oh, that's what he was talking about. And then when he said, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, and he looks at them and he says, and you're my friends. And a, couple, a day later, they're going to see him hanging on a cross and hopefully realize that that cross represents that he laid down his life, that he gave his life, that Jesus died on a cross as a way to lay down his life for us, his friends, to provide forgiveness of our sins to provide healing and reconciliation in our relationship with God, to make us right with God so that his Holy Spirit could live in us and guide us and comfort us and lead us into the life that he wants us to live. We want to be loving. But if we're honest, we'll recognize that selfishness gets in the way all too often and we need Jesus to be the loving people that we want to be. And I think the greatest things you've already heard for us today the greatest thing Andy would want us to do is to stop and consider, have I turned my life over to Jesus? Have I given my life back to Jesus? The biggest decision you make and the best decision you can make in your life. The reason that Andy invested his life in students was not just a calling from God, but it's what God did in his own heart and life that he wanted students and everyone he met to know the Jesus who had changed his life. And so today... The best way you and I can honor Andy's life is to know that we have given our lives back to Jesus who laid down his life for us. I'm going to invite the band to come back and sing one of our favorites. A love that is a Jesus kind of a love in which he laid down his life for us. As I come back, I want us to close our eyes. I want us to pray. I want us to talk to God. If you would say, yes, I have given my life back to Jesus and I'm trying to keep the faith, I want you to answer, ask the question, God, am I just spending my life or am I truly investing my life? That's how I want you to pray today. If, however, today you would say, you know, I haven't really given my life back to Jesus. I'm still kind of doing my own thing and I'm struggling. Maybe today's the day for you to say, Jesus, you gave your life for me. 
I'm in desperate need of you. Jesus, I give my life back to you today. If that's your prayer, I want you to talk to God right now. I want you to give your life back to Jesus. Jesus, thank you for giving your life. Thank you for laying down your life for us. And we thank you for the time that we had with Andy, to know him, to be loved by him, to see his great and godly example. We celebrate his life. He just lived. He inspires us to live for you, Jesus, and I pray. I pray, Lord Jesus, would you come into our hearts and lives today? We turn our lives over to you. And for that person who even right now is saying, Jesus, I give my life back to you. God, would you give them an experience with you that is unforgettable today in which they know that there is healing, that there is forgiveness, that there is cleansing, and that they are brand new in you, Lord Jesus. Send your Holy Spirit to live in them, fill them, and guide them, Jesus. May we all live our lives investing in the people around us. Lead us, guide us, Lord Jesus. We trust that you're going to answer the what now questions in our own lives. We're yours today. In your name we pray it. Amen.